good. Okay, good, good. So the stream is started. I'm on YouTube and man, being the one person production is a lot, but I'm going to get this party started. So let's launch the tweet. Ugh, done. And let's let these people into the room. Admit all. No more waiting room. Welcome, welcome one and all. I really told this chime thing to not happen, but Zoom is acting the fool. So we're going to have a new intro to the show this week. And let's just see if I am as technically good as I want to be for y'all. I don't boom. All right, so hello, thank you, welcome. Please take your time getting to your seats. Don't shove your neighbors. Uh, please make sure that you have not brought any outside food or beverage and only things that you have washed down with Lysol, Lysol doused foods only. And uh, welcome to Live on Lockdown, season one, episode six. I'm gonna start today's show with a beautiful piece of art from the New York Philharmonic performing Ravel's Bolero. They played individually, but they made a beautiful collective piece of work. Yes, work. Get it. Yeah. Bolero. What? It's my jam. Mm-hmm. I put that together for y'all. That was beautiful, right? That was beautiful. Okay, okay, welcome again. Hello, I'm Barrington Day Thurston. You're watching live on Lockdown, season one, episode six. And what I like to say about that is look, season one is also the last season, I hope. I am not looking for this series to go to series. Like this is a one and done kind of thing. If we're talking season two, season four, season five, that is like bad success. We do not want that. We want this to kind of be almost like an experiment that we could forget about a year from now. Be like, remember when Barrington made that show from his garage? No, I don't, because life is so great now. But in the meantime, uh, we are here to provide some comfort to each other, some perspective, to, to meet everybody <laughs> who's making all kinds of noises in the background, um, and, and to share uh, each other's perspective on this. So 
here's how the show is going to work this week. I'm going to start off by sharing a few things that I have observed, that I've found, that I've thought, that I've seen. Um, and then we're going to bring you in, uh, as we usually do, with some of your experience, your stories, like how you're making it through, what you're finding joy in, who you're most annoyed with. Uh, so, so to start with the perspective sharing, I, I just want to say uh, I'm wearing pants. And I think it's important to acknowledge I, I'm not that flexible. Pants. Pants, because we've got a lot of talk out there about how working from home and being on these webcams means that we don't have to wear pants anymore. And I'm not sure who these people are who've just been against like covering the bottoms of their bodies. I don't, I haven't had that be much of an issue, but I like the idea of pants. I also like the idea that look, in the middle of one of these calls, you might have to get up and leave the room. And that's when your ass would show and you don't, you don't want that. So you think you're secure in your pantslessness and maybe you grew up wanting to be like Winnie the Pooh for some reason, just a greedy bear, um, but not me. And I'm gonna suggest maybe not you. So this segment brought to you by pants. You should wear them even when you don't have to because you never know, because you never really know. Now it's been a really um, intense week here in the United States where most of us are based, certainly where I am broadcasting from Northeast Los Angeles in the neighborhood of Highland Park. And there's been some good coming out. I've been watching my mayor's daily briefings. I really like my mayor. He's, he's new to me, so I don't have any history with Eric Garcetti. I come from New York and Bill de Blasio, and I had a very strong feeling about Bill de Blasio, which I won't get into right now, but, but uh, Eric Garcetti is like a big teddy bear. I just want to hug him. I just want to hug him up real good. He's really a sweet guy. And, uh, but in the substance, he's announced some things that I thought were very compassionate. And there's an automatic filling up of EBT cards for those who are on that form of social service assistance. You don't have to file anything. You don't have to do any paperwork. You don't have to call an oversubscribed phone number. They just automatically max out your benefit for the next three months. And that's the sort of proactive, like caring for each other which I feel really good about. And there's so many things to not feel good about. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to a few of those things right now. But before I jump into the negativity and the criticism, I want to just celebrate my mayor, Eric Garcetti. He uses words like love all the time. The branding's been on point. We don't call our thing shelter in place, which evokes like active shooter running around like some Duke Nukem rampage. It's safer at home. And you know what it is? It is safer at home. I know these germs. This is my, I'll, I'll rebreathe my air. It's safer here. So you got safer at home. You got the automatic fill up of the EBT cards. Face coverings is what they're calling them now, not face masks. So I'm, I'm appreciative of the conscientious approach uh, of the mayor. One thing I'm not appreciative of is uh, how folks had been downplaying, you know, some of our political leaders in the beginning were downplaying the significance of this. And I found this graphic to be literally illustrative of that problem. So I'm gonna share this with you right now. This is a, uh, a sort of a moving chart that goes from the beginning where in the beginning, people were down at the bottom of this chart. A lot of folks saying, oh, COVID-19 doesn't hurt very many people, doesn't kill that many people. If you care about death, more people die of lung obstruction or high blood pressure. How come we're not sheltering in place for high blood pressure? What about, what about sepsis? But as time moves on and as the wrath of the math kicks in and exponential growth rears its head, we get to this place where COVID-19 is now the number three daily cause, cause of daily deaths in the United States. And it took a month for that to happen. So again, time is everything. A week is, feels like a year in terms of these exponential curves that we're living on. And if we don't take the measures that we need, then we end up paying the price in the form of life. So I really uh, give it up to Flourish Studio for creating that chart. Um, I also want to share a little perspective from uh, ProPublica. Oh, can't hear. Oh, <laughs> you can't hear the video only see. I need to stop. Can you hear me right now? Uh, throw up a comment in the chat room if you can even hear me. Otherwise, this is super weak. Okay, you can hear me, but you couldn't hear the video. You could only see it. 
interesting. All right, we're going to play with that later. Thank you so much for catching me mid mid monologue. Good to know that you couldn't hear the beautiful thing I shared. Also, I'm curious, can you hear the door chime every time somebody comes in the room? Somebody just speak for the people. I don't. Thank you. Great. Great. <laughs> Thank you, Marianne. So it's only here to annoy me, not the rest of you, which is great. I'm going to have to like stay focused and not be distracted. That was, uh, that was Marianne Robertson speaking for the people, ambassador to the live studio audience. We'll bring you back on in, in a moment, Marianne, but I'm gonna continue with my flow because uh, I just wanna get this off of my chest. Uh, this is a really painful story from ProPublica and it's one that I am starting to see mirrored in news coverage of this virus. The headline is early data shows African-Americans have contracted and died of coronavirus at an alarming rate. This is not an equalizing you know, pandemic. It's having very disproportionate effects in the US and they study Milwaukee to kind of create the example of what that means. So I'm just gonna like share two paragraphs from that article. Um, they say, as the disease spread at a higher rate in the black community, it made an even deeper cut environmental, economic, and political factors have compounded for generations, putting Black people at higher risk of chronic conditions that leave lungs weak and immune systems vulnerable, asthma, heart disease, hypertension, and diabetes. In Milwaukee, simply being Black means your life expectancy is 14 years shorter on average than someone white. As of Friday morning, African Americans made up almost half of Milwaukee County's 945 cases, and 81% of its deaths. That's in a county where the black population is only 26% of the total. So 26% of the population carrying, bearing the weight of 81% of the deaths. And Milwaukee's one of the few places in the US that's tracking the racial breakdown of people who've been infected by this coronavirus, which offers a glimpse of the disproportionate destruction it is inflicting on black communities nationwide. So it's a, it's a story I first heard uh, from my sister who knew someone who passed from COVID-19. He was 20 years old, uh, but he suffered from asthma and high blood pressure and ailments associated with obesity. And this just tipped him over the edge as well as his father a few days prior. So, you know, we, we've heard a lot of rhetoric about how Coronavirus comes for all of us. And it, it, it tries to, it tries to come for all of us, but it actually gets those of us who've been left behind by systems that have been in place for a really long time. So if you're dealing with pollution and weaker lungs because of breathing in that air, if you don't have access to healthcare, you get all kinds of other underlying conditions, this is forcing that. And so if, if you're poor, if you're black, if you're living without a home in this country in particular, because we're so cruel, then um, the virus has a greater chance of actually affecting you directly. It is not a great equalizer. It actually exacerbates the challenge. I have this thing written up on my wall. You can't see that it says, we are experiencing different pandemics. And it's just a reminder when I walk in here, like there's no one story here. We all have these different flavors of it. Some are painful in different ways. Some are joyful in different ways, but it is, it is kind of different. Uh, rounding, rounding this up, um, I just, a very brief, I got to share this story out of uh, the great state of Florida. If you're looking for things to just make you scratch your head, uh, Florida is a place that's going to do it. And this headline, it's a shit sandwich, Republicans rage as Florida becomes nightmare for Trump. So the petty, the petty person in me uh, is like, good, problems for him are better for us because we need to get this dude out. But again, there's, there's people suffering behind that headline, so it's not good. And, and so what's happened down there is a bunch of policies by the governor well before the pandemic showed up to, to weaken the unemployment system have made it nearly impossible for people to file claims. And when they do, they get like $236 a week. It's among the stingiest unemployment insurance systems in the whole country. And it was by design because Ron DeSantis wanted to cut the official unemployment number. So he made it hard to claim that you were unemployed. And the Republican Party down there, which is in charge, went along with it. And now real people can't get the real help they need because of the politics that came before them. So all the stuff we messed up before, it comes out now. 
like this Priya Parker, who's a friend and a great writer says, this is a social x-ray. Uh, and so we're seeing into the gaping maw that is Florida. Florida is always, you know, one of those places, right? And we have somebody in the room who's in Florida. So we'll, we'll check in uh, if he's willing, because I'd love to hear what, what the perspective is down there. But that story really shocked briefly, briefly, fleetingly, pettily pleased, and then devastated once I realized like, oh, with, this is a disaster, you know, compounded by human decisions um, on, on top of all that. There is a, I've got a post up on my Facebook page I want to share with y'all. And there's a, two more beats before we get a fun break. And then I'll bring you into the conversation. So start thinking about what you might want to share, where you're at, how you are. But this is a, this is a post that a friend sh uh, posted on their timeline. And it was a, a timeline post. And it's just, it's one of these clarifying things when you hear our president here in the US try to rewrite very recent history that we all have access to. And so some good citizen put together this timeline of relevant events, you know, this, especially in response to the claim that impeachment so distracted the president that he couldn't deal with the pandemic. And so you see like, oh, here's impeachment. And there's a first CDC warning a couple of weeks later. And then the next day, there's a campaign rally. And the next day is another campaign rally five days later. And so you have golfing and rallying and golfing and rallying and the impeachment things fading pretty quickly and all these claims of how great everything is uh, and they're not. And then recent claims of, well, how no one could have known things would be this bad. And that's not really true, right? March 6 is a magical day in the timeline of the federal response to this thing because you got a series of statements from the president about how great we're doing specifically about how great he's doing, about like he might as well, he wished he could have become an epidemiologist. He's just so naturally gifted at this stuff. All these doctors keep saying like, oh, how did you get so good at, at the science? Like nobody said that, but he needs to hear himself, applaud himself and high five himself. Unfortunately, not in the face, which would be more fun to watch. But on the same day that he's making all these crazy statements, The Guardian reports, that the Imperial College group out of London advised the White House Coronavirus Task Force of the terrifying projections for the disease. March 6th this is a month ago. This is a month ago. And the next day, homeboys golfing, homeboys golfing, et cetera. So, you know, I'm encouraging, I'm going to try to keep up the timeline myself. I didn't initiate it, but I think it's worth keeping a chronology of all of the steps that our federal leadership at the highest level is taking. And then sharing that with folks, because we also have an election coming up. And as we are living through now, we've realized that uh, elections, they, they kind of matter. So the last bit of, of this opening round, I'm running on like Rachel Maddow level time here with the opening round, but it's an experiment. So I love your feedback. I've been thinking about um, how, how else to put it, but scale, right? The scale of this thing. And in, in the numbers sense, how big is this event, right? Are we overblowing it? Is this truly historic? And, and so based on the projected numbers that feel real in the sense of they came from a data model and not from the butthole of our president, we have in the best case scenario, 100,000 US folks dead from this, up to 240,000, that's, that's the range. Um, so I'm gonna take the best case scenario. How, how good is that? How good is that? Well, uh, Hurricane Katrina, we had 2,000 people die. 9-11, immediate effect, just over 3,000 people dead. Vietnam War, over, what, 15 years, 58,000 people in terms of U.S. service members killed in their involvement in that war. Now, all this is just like direct deaths due to the thing. I'm not talking about secondary, I'm not talking about opportunity costs and all kinds of other ways of calculating impact, including the death of how many Vietnamese people died in the Vietnam War. I'm being very jingoistic on purpose. Like how many Americans died from a thing? Katrina was 2,000, 9-11 was just over 3,000, Vietnam War, 58,000. And we are being told that 100,000 is the best we can do. So in the best case scenario, in the best case scenario, we're talking 50 Hurricane Katrinas, 39 11s, 
or roughly two Vietnam Wars. And all those things have massive political impact, cultural impact, not to mention the impact on our lives. So this is mega, right? This is a big thing. It's worth spending time on. It's worth being upset and annoyed and frustrated. Um, and it's worth taking very seriously because we're already in the zone of major wars. Um, and on the other side of that, you have about 400,000 in World War II and 700,000 in the Civil War. And I hope we don't get to the point where the direct deaths from that, from coronavirus in the U.S., achieve those level of numbers. So I'm going to try doing this sharing again. And I'm a little worried if you couldn't hear the audio. So uh, keep me posted in um, the chat if you can hear the audio from this, from this video. Uh, that I'm playing right now. Did you hear that? Did you hear two random dudes say hello to each other? <laughs> no. Oh man, that's that's really oh that's so troubling. Yeah. No. Okay. Well, thank you for your honesty. Super appreciate it. Um, and so what that means is I can't share this really fun thing that I wanted to share with you. And I don't really, oh, wait a minute. I think I know why. All right, I'm going to try one more time. All right, did you hear some weird, <laughs> some weird voices there? And he just type, nope, you still didn't hear it. Cool, cool. So I am uh, running behind on the tech on this one. So that is good to know. All right. Well, in that case, <laughs> I had something really fun queued up for you to, to like balance out the 30 Hurricane Katrinas I just dropped on you, the 50 Hurricane Katrinas. And I, I can't do that right now. So instead, what I'm going to do is ask you, um, if you're in the Zoom app, use the hand raising function and, and raise your hand so I can do my check in. Um, and see how, how folks are doing, where you're at, how you're at, how you're getting through this. Uh, if you don't know how to do that, just like type in the chat box that you are you know, interested in or willing to talk, and I will bring you into uh, the conversation. All right, Martha Toure, I see you. I am, you are now unmuted. Let's go. All right, what's happening, Martha? Tell us where you are. Remind us of where you are. We've had you on before but I cannot remember. Uh, where Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you for Great. checking. Something I failed to I'm do. I'm in before. Marin County, California, which is just over the Golden Gate from yeah. San Francisco. We're very protected here. We have amongst the lowest numbers of cases and deaths in the United States. Uh, I want you all to know about an article in today's New Yorker it is an interview between Isaac Schottener and uh, a, a medical genius named Frank Snowfield, Snowden, excuse me, who has recently written a book about epidemics and society. And he makes the interesting point with respect to inequalities mm. that diseases are not random events in societies. They go where human society has created an opportunity, a niche for them. That's why we've had plagues and black deaths throughout history that settle most strongly in the people with the fewest accesses to resources. So an epidemic is a mirror of a society through which it has spread. And it isn't written in stone that we're gonna come out like Europe or the Egyptian Ptolemy or Emperor Justinian society. We can do things. It's on us to create what we're gonna look like from the point of view of history. We have some great examples like Doctors Without Borders. We can do this but we know what we got to do. Thank you, Martha. My goodness, that was, that was a breath of fresh air, breath of truth. Uh, I, I agree with you. So I don't, uh, I don't have anything to, to pick apart. I think it is a mirror and it presents us with a choice. Like you said, 
one of the inspiring things that I'm starting to see, and I think we may have talked about this on a previous show, is you know what opportunity do we have to fix some of the broken pieces of our system um, that have allowed the pain of this pandemic to spread in certain populations so much. And so that comes down in some ways, obviously, to our healthcare system, but also our unemployment system. Um, I, you know, I'm going to call an audible. I'm going to share this clip from uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And I realized what was happening, why you couldn't hear the audio. So that has been remedied. Um, but I want to share this bit of, uh, I would just, I'll call it compassion and honesty and intelligence kind of all rolled into one. Basically what had happened was I was hanging out on Instagram live because that's like one of the few places you can be without like a face covering nowadays is like Zoom and Instagram live and, and your own home. Otherwise you got to cover up. And so I was uh, on the IG because that's how you interact. And it said, AOC is going live. I was like, cool, let me see what homegirl's talking about. And she was just taking questions. So I threw a question in. And the question I asked her, you will see what that is uh, in just a moment. Ooh, and actually this is not gonna work because I, there's this option. If anybody's out there trying to pro Zoom, I got a Zoom pro tip for you. When you do screen share, there's a little teeny hidden secret button, like a little secret button, and it says share computer sound. Um, and you have to make sure to check that otherwise You'll disappoint all of your audience <laughs> when they can only see the image. So it means that also you didn't hear the beautiful music I was playing earlier, which did not set the tone <laughs> whatsoever. So here we go. This is uh, AOC. Let me just actually fill the screen with this. Oh, and I have to type my password because why not ask me right now for my password? Uh, some chat room help. Let me know if you can do this. Oh, hi, Baratunde. How do you carry the burden of your constituents' challenges right now and care for yourself? Uh, that's a very kind question. Thank you. Um, I don't, you know, I think everyone responds to stress really differently. Um, you know, I what I try to do is I feel like I've changed my pace um, a lot in that I, I tried to like really protect my days off um, before this whole crisis hit. Like if I had a day off, I really tried to protect it and like nothing would happen that day. I have complete control over that day. And what I've, how I've kind of been shifting since I represent Queens and I represent the Bronx, which are some of the hardest hit communities in the country right now, is, you know, is I kind of recognize that there are some days where I'm going to be just like working all day, you know, 12 hours or more. Um, but there are other days where I'm just going to accept that I'm not going to be as productive on a certain day. And I'm being kind of ruthless about cutting things that are completely unnecessary or cutting things that can wait. And I think for everyone out there right now, obviously everyone's not um, in my position. You know, I can't, I can't, I'm not in a position where I can just be like, I'm, I don't need to work as much um, because, you know, I'm, I'm serving a community that's very hard hit as a public servant. But I do think that, um, it's really important to get the message across that you do not or should not feel the pressure to be as as productive now um, as you were before. This is a very stressful moment. A lot of people are doing double duty. Basically, if you are a caregiver or if you are a parent in any way and now all of a sudden you have to work from home and take care of your kids, guess what? Now you have two jobs simultaneously. Um, and we should recognize that we should make space for that. And, you know, it's a kind of a function of capitalism that we measure people's worth in their work productivity, not in their actual full worthiness as a human being. Um, we strip away how good you are to a community. It's like how much you do in a community doesn't matter how much 
you how good of a parent you are doesn't matter like all of these things don't matter um what matters is how productive you were how much money you made or how much work you put in this week how many hours so you get the idea and she continues on for a few more minutes on that theme but i think to, to martha's point um you know, we have a, this choice before us, not just in the immediate, you know, crisis addressing moment, but like, how do we value ourselves? And are we just measuring our economic output and be like, yo, that's the thing, like how much money you make is the thing. Uh, and, and to her point, it isn't. I also want to roll in at this moment. Um, I had you know, a couple of years ago, I made a show with Spotify and the now defunct Mike.com website. And it was created in advance of um, the 2016 election. And we were dealing with music artists and the issues they were passionate about. Um, and so this one uh, was dealing with criminal justice and reform and like trying to do that better. And one of the guests in this show was at the time a sergeant in the New York Police Department named Sergeant. Uh, well, his name's not Sergeant, but you know what I'm saying? Like he it probably was part of his name at that point, actually. Anyway, Edwin Raymond is this dude's name. Black dude, really long beautiful locks and, you know, grew up in, in East New York uh, neighborhoods and decided to become a police officer to protect and serve. And he became a whistleblower in the NYPD for calling out the racism of the NYPD and having a quota system for like who would get ticketed for jaywalking or riding their bike on the sidewalk. And his managers, his lieutenants at the time would just be very clear. If you're on the Upper East Side, like, no, 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 don't ticket them go out to bed right? Go out to Crown Heights, go out to East New York and, and ticket those kids. They'll resist less, blah, blah, blah. So he blew the whistle. He secretly recorded his supervisors. And it's not normal for people in his position who kind of speak up to power that way to stay in the job. It's, it's quite the opposite. Usually they get flushed out. Sometimes worse things happen to them in terms of their safety. But he has thrived to the extent possible. He's been promoted. He's now a lieutenant. And I wanted to talk to him about what is it like to be in law enforcement and on the front lines in a different sense of this crisis and of this pandemic. So here is a, a moment from our interview. It's a 13 minute interview. I will never do that to you and just like force you to watch a 13 minute video in one sitting. That feels like cruel and unusual punishment, a different form of like sheltering at home. But I will um, share a few moments to uh, let you hear directly what he has to say without me trying to paraphrase it. Yeah. I, I think I just got one more for you, brother. And that is, it's an open-ended well, question, but mm -hmm. is there anything else on your mind or anything else you want the public to know, given your perspective on this crisis in law enforcement? Take this thing serious, you know, take it serious. The number, I mean, I've, I've, I'm watching a lot of these videos about uh, 5G and, and, and all these videos about film your hospital. And again, the, just the amount of unconscious people, which is really people who are dead at home. That's, it just comes over the radio as unconscious. That, uh, that amount of, alone is alarming enough to know that this is something that should be taken serious. Um, one of the things that stands out about um, at a glance, about 90% of them had other conditions. And, it, you know, it really spoke to me um, regarding how livable we make certain conditions. Many of them which are reversible, you know, or, or can be eradicated or, or completely prevented. So we, sh we, when this is over or even now, we have to find a way to make sure if something is reversible, we do it. If something is preventable, we prevent it. Because the, the, the COVID is what's pushing it across the edge to the point of, of uh, mortality, but a lot of conditions already exist, you know. Um, that, that's where I was. So I want people to practice healthier lifestyles and take this thing serious. Please, yeah. Please. So again, that was Lieutenant Edwin Raymond. And, you know, the, the, he alluded to something that he shared in an earlier part of the interview, which I basically asked him, like, tell me about your pre-corona life as a lieutenant, where he's responsible for 40 of uh, police officers and your current life. And he said in a normal week, you might get one to two calls of someone unconscious, you know, dead, dead at home. And he's got nine sometimes, you know, in the space of a few days, one other lieutenant has had like 19 
in a single week. And it sort of wears on him emotionally of like, you take this oath to protect and serve and you're showing up to just dead bodies. That's not, you, you kind of miss the opportunity to do the protecting part. And so there's an emotional toll that he uh, shared that he's bearing, uh, which is another piece of this puzzle, which I'm like, fascinated with and want to give some attention to because it's not, you know, we think of like the people in the ERs and yes, never denying any of what they're going through, but also you got police officers out there. And what he brought up that reminded me of Martha's comment was about, you know, people being pushed right over the edge and then you have these pre-existing conditions in, in the U.S. case. Uh, racism is like a pre-existing condition. Um, and so something like this comes along and it's just enough to tip you over the edge. And unfortunately, in this case, that edge is often from life to death uh, or maybe from financial solvency to, uh, to bankruptcy. All right, so I'm going to roll this fun clip. And in the meantime, think about if you want me to bring you on, do the little hand raise thing in the Zoom app or just type it into the chat uh, if you don't know where that button is. And if you're just on your phone, um, swipe. And if you're only on the phone, like you're not using the app, then I might just call on you and you can, you can decline uh, you know, and I won't force you to put yourself out there into the world. But in the meantime, this is something totally different because uh, I've been very, you know, I try in these shows to like mix the high and the low and the joy and the pain, the sunshine and rain. <laughs> Anybody who names that hip hop reference, you get something. I don't know what yet, but I'm gonna give you something. So Gary Anthony Williams is an actor. Uh, he did the voice work for Uncle Ruckus in this great show, The Boondocks, uh, years back. And he has been doing this thing, you know, acting alone, basically a social distancing, sort of physical distancing acting workshop um, and, and playing scenes with his fellow actors. So this is an example of sort of improv meets acting meets physical distancing in the age of corona check it out hello oh, hello jones is that you oh yes it is Bob. how the hell did you get this number we live in the information age. really well i'm gonna hunt oh, you oh you're hunting me well i'm already hunting you you've been to my i've been in your comic book collection what's that in your hand oh you mean this is that my I'm gonna find you. <laughs> You're a dead man, Jones. A dead man! Hello. All right. So Gary Anthony Williams, follow him on Instagram. There are so many playful, fun scenes, and it's usually like a, a two-person scene. And once you, you watch a bunch of them, you kind of get the game. But it's just really interesting to see people fill in the gaps creatively, have some fun. But not everything coming out of this is uh, is terrible or the worst. So uh, what I am going to uh, do now, I'm doing one more pass. I'm actually going to um, unmute. No, that's crazy. I'm not going to unmute everybody. I think that's a little wild. But I will throw um, gallery view on just to wave and see everybody at the same time. Hello, Darby. Hello, Locksmith Robbie. Hello, Ronald. Good to see you again. Ronald, thanks for coming back. Swan, I see you. Well, I see your name uh, up here. You know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a thing. Swan, I've unmuted you. Is that okay? It is. Hi, love. This is Hello. awesome. Where, um, where, where are you located right now? I'm in Boston, Massachusetts, because I wanted to be around family and help out. So it's yeah. been pretty awesome. Uh, for some context to those listening, watching now or later, uh, Swan and I went to college together, Harvard 99. And I think we last saw each other at South by Southwest, actually, in a very socially undistant hotel lobby where we could still do those sorts of things. Yeah, that was an amazing time to catch up. We've seen each other cross paths over the years, summit, South by, all sorts of things. All, all the stuff we're not doing anymore. What's, what's, um, what's getting you through this? You know, how are you um, maintaining your sanity, maybe your income? <laughs> Uh, your health, give, give us a little flavor of, of your life in Boston in terms of, of processing this. I mean, some things are easier. I came here to help take care of my parents in their 70s, do grocery shopping. But the irony is, since they're retired, 
they cook all of my favorite foods, all my meals. So I'm gaining the COVID-19. Um, so that part's <laughs> easier. My mom did laundry for me the other day. I was like, is this what coming home is like? So that's been pretty, pretty great. Um, and then, you know, keeping sanity and kind of keeping the faith is just trying to see the other side of this. Like we know we're all in it for a little while, but just seeing the generosity and kindness and, and bravery, um, and bravery of people on the front lines has just been yeah. really inspiring. I mean, we all get annoyed by the errant person who's not following the rules, but then the overwhelming generosity and kindness of people. Um, I have to think we're going to come out of this stronger. It's just, you know, going to be a little tough for a few months. Thank you for that. And and how are things feeling in Boston? Like in terms of the, the mood and the tone, you know what that city normally feels like. What, what is your observation on that? Yeah, it's not too bad. I mean, um, Boston, I guess, follows rules pretty well. We've been pretty good about it. But to be fair, I'm not smacking Puritans, the Puritans, right? It's, it's that Puritan blood. <laughs> right? I will say, though, I mean, you know, kind of, I don't know if you saw this, but, you know, our alma mater in the beginning, just like everybody, it was taking a while to adjust to the new normal. So figuring out what to do with financial aid students, trying to get home, getting people high-speed internet. I think because Boston tends to be a very academic and somewhat productive um, city, Everyone, I think, has been kind of moving forward into how do we fix problems? How do we, you know, how do we kind of like all band together and help each other? But to be fair, because we can't really go around, I can't drive to another neighborhood or community and check it out. Um, but, you know, my parents are in Newton. It's a little further outside. So, you know, there's plenty of room for people to take walks. I've gone around, made sure all the neighbors that are elderly have somebody to go food shopping for them, et cetera. But it's been pretty great here. But, you know, as you know, I was in New York for 13 years and most of my friend fam is there. So that's been what I've actually been keeping tabs on, trying to make yeah. sure, you know, those people are okay because it's far but not really that far you know right right well thank you for sharing thanks for joining the show great to hear your voice and uh keep enjoying the, the COVID-19 sounds like your parents are some great cooks they're pretty awesome and thanks to you for kind of continuing to give us tidbits and insights and a peek into your brain because I look forward to these moments of wisdom from you absolutely yes um well you're welcome and thanks for joining I'm gonna I'll put you back on mute and we are moving on um, uh, next to someone we heard from earlier. I, I designated her the ambassador for the group, uh, but that would be Mary Ann Roberts. Uh, you are okay. unmuted. You are in live on lockdown. What's up? Well, um, thank you. Um, I was really... Um, I'm not very articulate, sorry. Um, okay. I'm a retired person, I live in Vermont. It's a ridiculously sheltered kind of place, but I'm also kind of aware of stuff going on like you were talking about the, uh, the effects of, of uh, racism and, and poverty and all of these things. And I, um, I wanna know, uh, my brother who, I, who lives in the Boston area is always sending me stuff about how um, more people approve of Trump now than ever. He has the highest um, rating, approval rating that he's ever had. And he, he shows me these breakdowns about people. Um, it's just the idea that, that we're so polarized and the way information, it is, is there anyone who's working on how we can communicate in ways so that we're not always preaching to the choir that, that, that we're actually hearing each other? I don't know. That's what I get frustrated about. Because I think the things that uh, that that I've forgotten her name, the wonderful thing that uh, that um, woman spoke about, how yeah. we can change, we can move. But I feel like we need to be moving together. I don't know. Is that it makes sense. You uh, do not need to worry about not um, being articulate. That was very clear. I'm sharing on the screen right now, 538's kind of popularity tracker with uh, this president, just to provide some history and context to the number. He's at 45.8% uh, approval and 50% disapproval. Oh, so <laughs> he's still net negative. Um, and this is not currently, you know, the best he's ever done. I think the best looks like, or actually 45.5. So maybe, maybe he's just eked out his personal best. 45.5 uh, way back in you know, like inauguration day before he could do anything terrible as president. And, uh, and then 45.8 today. So I, so I think, you know, I'm gonna stop the screen share and uh, I, you know, who's doing the communication in a way that multiple parties can hear. 
Um, I think Dr. Anthony Fauci actually is getting that done. He's regularly on Fox News, which is great. He's credible. Um, he, he, he's found a way, I think, to maintain his sort of scientific and um, organizational credibility in the face of the president's random, whim, whimsical to dangerous range of responses to this crisis. And Fauci has done it without sort of debasing himself. You see a lot of people get around this president and there's like this, this uh, gravitational pull of bullshit where you get too close to planet Trump and you just you start getting warped and your sense of truth starts getting warped and your values. And you, Ted Cruz is like the greatest example ever. Like this is a man who said all the true things about Trump back in the day. And then Donald Trump said, basically said his wife was ugly and his dad killed JFK and he's stupid, right? And Ted Cruz is like the greatest carrier of water for this president. So he's uh, uh, an example of the opposite of an Anthony Fauci who's like gotten close to this president uh, in Fauci's case and maintained himself. And I think that matters because he's communicating real information and he's doing so in multiple venues. And if you look at his approval ratings, I don't have those right on hand, but he is like the third most talked about person in the country or maybe the world, but certainly in the US, which is really interesting. Um, and he's being listened to, not always followed, but his words are getting to both sides. Um, and then my take on Trump's popularity in general, I think you know George H.W. Bush got super popular right in the beginnings of the first Gulf War. Wartime president, people rally around the flag. It's a phenomenon. We have a whole name for it. It's called rally around the flag, even though the flag is a person in the, embodied by the presidency. And then he lost to this young man from Hope, Arkansas, uh, because the economy was tanked and the war couldn't cover that up. And so I think, you know, nothing is quite, precedent doesn't always apply to this president, but he's been preparing from day one to run on his economic story. He will not, he will be denied that story come November. And that is a painful reality for the people who have to suffer through it, but it is a helpful reality for a narrative that means replacing him. Uh, and so, yeah, his, his popularity hasn't budged very much, but I think it, the way he handles and mishandles this and the ability for people to be honest about where those mistakes were is going to help his challenger in the fall make a very strong case that when it came down to it, when the country faced a real crisis, when all the things Hillary Clinton said would happen actually happened, this dude led to 50 Katrinas right? Like, like George W. Bush had the one Katrina. And this is 50x that potentially, maybe more, sadly. So uh, I'm never going to count out this president in terms of his ability to bounce back. But I think this is bigger. This virus doesn't obey him in the same way that he can shape other events. It doesn't respect him. It clearly doesn't even want to infect him. Like the virus is so anti-Trump, it won't even infect him. That's a special power. That's a really weird, special power. But um, thank you for the question. I hope I didn't go on too long. And uh, Megan, I just want to thank you in the chat. I saw you, you have a nine-month-old sleeping in your lap. Congratulations on cloning yourself through organic processes. And uh, we see you in the chat and we send you love wherever you are. So if anyone else uh, wants to pop on, I only grabbed Swan because I knew her. Um, I'm, again, I won't do that to anybody else, but you can kind of see how this goes. I'm very uh, gentle and kind, for the most part, host. Uh, I would love to, um, to chat with you. If not, I will play us out with something really amazing now that I, uh, now that I know how to get the audio in. Uh, Megan wrote in, I don't think his popularity will survive the tsunami of grief that is about to be unleashed. Yeah, that's another, that's another real observation. I think so much of the people who love Trump and have literally gone to his rallies and rallied around him multiple times are going to lose people. You know, you look at the map of states that were late to or have yet to implement a stay-at-home order, and it's Trump country. You know, it's, it's Florida, it's Georgia, it's Mississippi, it's Alabama, it's Arkansas. It's all these places that he has given some voice to actually and some sense of pride and people really enjoy that and um 
everything in the data suggests that the Southeast United States is gonna get rocked by this thing because of age, because of underlying comorbidity and health issues, and because of a lateness by the part of most of those weak governors to initiate policies that will flatten the curve. And so it's, it's very, I think it's different from talking about the border. If you're in a state that doesn't have one that borders Mexico or ICE detention centers that aren't nearby you or incarceration when you don't have a jail or prison nearby, this pandemic will affect every community. And we're all gonna know people who are gone because of it. And that's not like a Democrat conspiracy. They're really dead. It, that's the truth that goes past the Fox and Friends bubble. And it's kind of hard to create misinformation around the, the physical information of someone who's no longer a part of your life. And if that starts to happen and people start to your point, Megan, grieve, that grief may be associated with anger on the other side. And again, that's why it's very important to start now being very clear about no one president can stop a virus, you know, <laughs> not like some of these pastors you see out there just like blowing it away, but you can slow it down. And George W. Bush had a pandemic policy, Barack Obama had a pandemic policy, and this president purposefully disabled that policy, defunded it, closed the part of the National Security Council that was in charge of it. And when it was at the doorstep of this country, he ignored it and he played it up like, oh, it's just the flu. What are you so concerned about? And he's still ignoring it. Even as he gets tougher, I'm not going to, I'm not going to cover my face. And, you know, it's a suggestion. So once people you love start to die because of that kind of messaging, unnecessarily, you, you didn't even send someone off. It's not like they, they enlisted in the armed services to go forth and, and defend the flag. They were just going to church going to choir rehearsals, that's, that's going to be hard to come back from. And it's sad if that's what it's going to take. But I, I think it's less deniable. I'm going to the chat again. I see people are more interested in typing. So thank you for playing along with me as we experiment with the format of this show. Um, Anthony Ware has a question about the ripples of economic stimulus in the U.S. versus countries like Germany and Canada. Yo, so I'm going to give some credit to my bae, my fiance, Elizabeth Stewart. We've been talking about, you know, I mentioned this whole rant earlier about scale and how we got like, this is 50 Katrinas and two Vietnams and 39 11s and, and hopefully not, but possibly a World War II in terms of U.S. casualties. World War II reshaped the global order, you know, and it didn't actually involve every nation in the world. This actually does. And so who is positioned to emerge from this with strength versus weakness? And in addition to the internal suffering of the US, um, the fact that we didn't have national stay at home to narrow the gap of when our economy would be severely affected by this means that effect is gonna be spread out much longer. And a nation like China, which was the first in and probably first out, will be the first back up on its feet. And they're, who's sending equipment around the world right now? China. Who's sending doctors around the world right now? China. That was America. After World War II, we called it the Marshall Plan. We helped rebuild Germany because we had all this loot, all this, this war money, all, these, all this stuff. Look, you, it's not a whole history lesson, but I think um, to your question about you know, Canada, Germany, like any nation that took this seriously, any leadership that was early and consistent and honest with its people, like Angela Merkel was when she scared her folks by saying 70% of our populace may become infected with this thing will likely recover faster. And that's going to make them more competitive. And they're going to be in a position of power to draw new boundaries, whether those are political or policy or cultural. That's what's possible there. Uh, Canada, I know a little less about, so I, I can't speak to what their policies have been. For sure, better than America. I'm sure that because we are bad. We're just bad at this. We're bad at pandemics right now. Uh, Sharon Mosley, I have to leave soon. Here in White Plains, seen things strangely calm, even though we're not far from the COVID-19 epicenter. Thanks for doing this. Thank you for joining, Sharon, if you're still here, if not. Um, and then Megan recommends a book, Braiding Sweetgrass, A Bit of Medicine for the Moment. It's an incredible book. All right, so that is the chats. Uh, thank you for those who posted in there. I'm going to play us out with something so fun. Like I don't like to build up and 
Many of you already saw this. So if you did, you don't have to feel free, feel like you want to stick around. But it's just an incredible video uh, out of the UK recorded a week ago by a family that's been doing these like Von Trapp style musicals in their living room. Uh, before I play that, I just, you know, Locksmith Robbie, can you hear me, Locksmith Robbie? Wave your hand physically if you, all right, Locksmith Robbie. So listen, I, you can look at me now. You can do this, call me off like a ref if you don't want me to call on you, but I'm just seeing your whole get up and it's very compelling physically. So give me two thumbs up if I can come to you or give me the wave off if you don't want me to come to you. What's it going to be? Two thumbs up. All right, folks, this is, I'm going to, I wanted to end by, you know, in, on the hour, but I just want to chat with unmuting Locksmith Robbie. Can you unmute yourself maybe? Okay. Can okay. You hear yes, I can hear you. So, so what, what, tell us what we're looking at and tell us where you are. I just want to say uh, that your uh, program today and probably in the future is very informational uh, and uh, I appreciate listening to it and hearing it. Uh, I don't need to add anything. Uh, I'm just absorbing the information because you seem to try and cover everything, not just one thing, but everything. Well, uh, thank, thank you for that. I appreciate that. I recognize your voice. It's good to have you here, fam. Uh, and, you know, stay safe, stay home. And you are, you are ready. This brother's got the... <laughs> Got the mask, got the hoodie, got the baseball cap. I think that's like a Wisconsin baseball cap. Oh no, Washington, Washington baseball cap. So yeah, I was uh, on the uh, I was on um, the Zoom chat uh, earlier with my wife. She turned uh, sixty nine today, and your grandmother turned ninety five today. I know. I gave her a call. This is my my uncle Dana. Everybody, Dana Robinson down in. Uh, the DMV, uh, DC, Maryland, Virginia area, and I didn't, I didn't know your code name. Locksmith Robbie threw me off, and then yeah. because you are, you know, showing up incognito with the face mask. <laughs> yeah, I did that for effects, visual effects. Oh, it worked, bro. It worked. Yeah, I was like, yo, somebody's about to perform surgery or rob a liquor store or go outside. Like that's the thing you can't even. You don't even know why people, we, you have good reasons to wear masks nowadays. That have I'll, nothing just to do. One, I'll just add one more thing and then I won't yeah. talk anymore. Um, the reason why I like your program as opposed to some of the others, uh, it covers all classes of people, all races of people. Uh, and that's very important because people uh, in the world realize that those that are considered low class or no class, are the ones that get killed, uh, get uh, no exposure, uh, die quicker, die faster. Uh, and shows like yours that's very informative shows you that it's not a it's not a race thing, it's a class thing. Mm -hmm. People that don't have money, people that uh, don't have influence, uh, they're completely dismissed by the the news media, by the dic dictators, by those in power, by those in money. And so the, the amount of deaths that are, that are occurring all over the world, not just in the United States, is so prolific uh, that people uh, just dismiss it because it gets no media play. It's organizations like yours or news media outlets like yours that get that type of message out. And uh, I appreciate that. Well, I, I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Happy birthday to Fran. Uh, that was my uncle in uh, the DC area. Thank you all for joining. We are out of time. What I was gonna play for you, I dropped a link in the chat instead. Um, and as a man named Ben Marsh posted it on Facebook, you probably have already seen it. It's literally been shared uh, hundreds of thousands of times and viewed tens of millions but it's a family singing a song from Les Mis, but they like remixed it and rewrote it for being uh, quarantined in their home. Hilarious, so joyful, and actually really good too. Like they're harmonizing. It's a six part, you know, a se sextet singing here. So enjoy that. Uh, thanks for bearing with my technical issues. And, and we'll be doing the show. I've, I've worked out a new pattern for the show. So we're here every Sunday, 3 p.m., 
Eastern, Central, Pacific. See, Zoom has got me all twisted. I don't even know what time zone I'm in. What is time? 3 p.m. Pacific. That's where I am. 6 p.m. Eastern. Uh, and then Thursday nights, 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Eastern. I'm on Instagram Live. That's like a different vibe of show. It's a lot less rolling clips in and all kinds of multimedia juggling. So it's a little less stress on my heart and my mind and my fingers. Uh, so I, I try both different ways. So I'll see you hopefully next Sunday, um, if not on Thursday, or all the things. And if you have not known, I have a phone number, 202-894-8844. You can text in. I send you happy birthdays. I'll engage in battle with you if you want that in terms of uh, arguing back and forth. But mostly I send out good information, good vibes, and I try to make things locally relevant, which when you sign up, you, you let me know what city you live in. And so I'm, I'm targeting opportunities to volunteer, to help out, to be useful. Um, and then also to have some fun. So thank you everyone very, very, very much. Isabella, I see you just got here, but it's all good. I'm recording this. You can always go to baritunday.com slash live. This is one of the rougher ones, number six. I thought it'd be smoother, but I keep experimenting with different things. So I uh, look forward to my full interview with uh, Lieutenant Edwin Raymond. I'll put that up on Instagram likely tomorrow. And uh, again, I'll see you uh, in your inbox or on your phone screen. Or, you know, maybe I'll just pop up outside your home, but you won't know because I'll be in a mess. Could be anybody. Could be my uncle. All right. Peace, y'all.